Welcome to the seminar. My name is Danny Gill and today I'm representing the live network for whom I am an audience development officer. This seminar is in light of the upcoming deadline for the Literature Project Award to talk about the changing scene of Irish literature, what audiences are getting and how we can connect better with writers, publishers and audiences. Today, I'm joined by independent literary producers Zoe Cummings and Brendan McEvely and publisher of Tram Press, Sarah davis Goff. Thank you for joining the session. Thanks for having us. Hello. Um, <laughs> my first uh, question is to Brendan. Brendan, obviously, you and I have worked also for Words Ireland, who have been advocating the past number of years for further funded opportunities for writers and literary makers to engage in a production process. And I just wanted to ask you, from the point of view of this specific award, Literature Project Award, how does it change things? What is the opportunity, in your opinion, for literary makers and writers? Um, yeah, I think, well, I suppose it's like for writers, it's an extra 200 grand plus into the kind of literature pool or like money available from the Arts Council for writers. Um, it means, I think it tips the balance back in favour of writers, also in terms of where programming ideas are going to come from. So writers don't have to now wait to be invited by a journal or a festival or an organization to, you know, uh, and maybe be pitched that organization's idea, they can kind of dream up whatever they want themselves and maybe go to an organization or just manage the project by themselves. Um, so I think, yeah, we'll see um, more writer led stuff and maybe more collaborations across art forms as well. So writers who, I think like, I suppose the, the delineations between art forms is understandable, um, but it's not natural necessarily. I think a lot of writers do other things. They have friends who are doing other things or they know other artists in other forms and they talk to each other and they want to work together. And this, this kind of provides that opportunity. Um, and yeah, I suppose it's just an opportunity for writers to earn a more meaningful kind of a package if you like rather than kind of the bitty you know holy show we're, we're offering fees of up to kind of five or six or seven hundred quid in cases for you know what ends up being a week's a week's work maybe for a writer and even that's not ideal and um, i think that this is yeah this is just more meaningful pay for an artist to get their teeth into mm -hmm. something a bit bigger something that might like be a part-time job for them for the year that gives them 15 or 20 grand that's you know half a wage um so yeah 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 definitely and I guess like you're saying there the award last year was for up to 20,000 and this year it's now up to 30,000 which is very promising to see Zoe you were one of the successful recipients of last year's literature project award can you talk a little bit about your project where it came from and and what it was sure well I'm still in the middle of doing it it's uh, I'm working with the Royal Irish Academy for people who don't know what the Royal Irish Academy is it's an academic institution they're based in Dublin in Dawson Street and they kind of promote the study of science and social sciences and humanities but they have an absolutely amazing library in the in Dawson Street uh, which is just so beautiful but also houses thousands and thousands of manuscripts and books including some manuscripts that go back to the 12th century like the book of the dun cow which is our oldest irish text so i really wanted to go into the library and delve into what was in there and use that as a starting point to do a podcast that looks at nature writing that has come out of this library over the years and writers who've contributed to it and use that as a sort of a starting point and a jump spring to commissioning new writers to do new pieces of writing about the natural world. So uh, it's a seven part podcast. And um, throughout that, I'll be commissioning nine or 10 writers. Um, most of the episodes, six of the episodes focus on an individual writer, plus uh, the podcast itself, which is called Shelf Marks, goes into the library, takes something off the shelf, looks at what the description is, or the references, or the biography of the person that I'm reading, and then the writer in turn takes that little prompt and uses it and echoes 
something that comes out of the institution to look at the world in a new way. So, for example, um, one of the naturalists that I'm looking at is Cynthia Longfield, and she was uh, called Madame Dragonfly. So she was she studied dragonflies and she was really influential in the study of dragonflies. And Amanda Bell, who is a poet and a writer, she's taking that prompt or that echo and she's looking at things like poison and iridescence and collecting. So she's going on to write something about it. So that was really the idea was really to get my hands into this library and have a look at what was there. Yeah, amazing. And, you know, so great, Zoe, I suppose I feel with the Literature Project Award, it's been a fantastic funded opportunity for people like you, who many people will obviously know in the literary sector already, who have been for many years now producing interesting things in the arts. And I guess it's great to see something specifically in the discipline of literature where you could go in like that with a particular idea and also commission a number of of artists within that umbrella like it's an amazing opportunity and it, it just sounds really fascinating that whole whole project sounds really fascinating well the the good thing about it is that you know i've work, been working in broadcast for years but sometimes you feel a little bit imprisoned by that format and you want to go and do something that's a little bit more experimental and play with things mm -hmm. and this was an opportunity to go and really play with some texts and talk to writers see what they wanted to write without being bound by a time frame or a specific format. So it really opened up a lot of sort of imaginative doors, really. Yeah. Um, Sarah, there's a connection with Brendan uh, through Holy Show and the people that he has worked with in the past number of years. I'm thinking most recently, obviously, Sarah Baum and Alphabet of Birds, and then previously in Mullaney and Minor Monuments. Um, for you as a publisher, obviously, Trump is much admired in, in Ireland and internationally. You have uh, prize winners and a lot of conversation starters among your list. For you as a publisher, Sarah, in the contemporary literary landscape that we are in, what are you looking to bring to an audience and what is your focus at Tramp? Um, so our focus it's tricky it's tricky to speak about because I think every book that we've published is really different and really unique um but I think what we're looking for as publishers is probably the exact same thing that readers are looking for and that's to just be to be blown away to read something on a page that you've just never seen there before but which you kind of know to be true and I think for me the best reading experiences are when I read some fresh perspective and I find out something entirely new or I read something that I'm like, oh, I didn't know I was the only person who felt this or thought this. And it's it's really nice to have that kind of camaraderie. Um, so, I mean, we're just always looking to have our socks blown off. Um, and that's really not an easy thing to find, which is why we just publish a couple of titles a year. Um, but um, yeah, we sort of have a rule at um, Tramp to only publish when we're really like, our hearts are set alight and, it's not a question of whether we should, but how, how quickly we can and how well we can. Um, and and yeah, that's that is a tricky thing to find. I think readers go to books for just a huge variety of different reasons. And I'm not sure that one reason is better than another, particularly. Um, I think um, you know, looking for a comfort read in Mills and Boone is just as um just as valid as you know, reading something very sort of contemporary and cutting edge and and frankly weird like solar bones. Um I mean, I think I think both of these points of view um, should be catered for. And I think that's something that's great about this award is that um, publishers, unfortunately, don't always make the correct decisions um, historically. And if writers can find other ways to bring their work to readers, you know, so much the better. I think that's great. Mm. Four of your writers happen to have gone on to produce uh, work for the stage. Uh, Sarah, Ian, Mike McCormack also and Jeremy Griefa most recently. Um, Brendan, you've recently produced um, Alphabet of Birds with Sarah Baum. It wasn't under the Literature Project Award, it was under a different banner, but it is in this realm of what we are talking about, about adaptation and collaboration. Can you talk a little bit about what that piece is and how it has emerged to the different artists are that are involved? Yeah, I suppose maybe to, to start with like why I started making things for stage to begin with we kind of through Words Ireland and, and your work kind of around in like region regional venues in Ireland uh, the Arts Council were kind of asking us would the literature sector not apply for touring 
money more frequently that would be another way to pay artists so we got in conversations with venues and it was just really interesting to hear what venues had to say about what fields venues and what doesn't across art forms um, and what they kind of hope for from literature and you know they spoke to us about introducing music or introducing other art forms as a way to um, bring in audiences for what had traditionally been for whatever reason like a difficult sale to you know if, if audience are used to big kind of uh, product and values when they go into a, a black box auditorium and you know they see the set design and lots of different artists on stage and the amount of money that's gone into that it's very hard to produce that in literature if the budget is like three times a fee of 150 or 200 quid to pay writers do something unrehearsed for an afternoon and um, so I was kind of interested in uh, what how would we take what we do in literature what happens on the page and bring that to the stage uh, if writers had more time to consider what was going to happen up on the stage what would they do how would they spend their time researching or rehearsing or who would they get involved um, and I'd seen around the time we we're kind of thinking about that, I'd seen a work by a visual artist called Gary Coyle, a photographer who also kind of, I guess, just writes personal essays about the photographs he's taking. And he's an ace on artist, so he's like, you know, serious artist in that world. Um, but he applied to the project award for a couple of different shows, but the one I saw was Minor Monuments. Um, happened at the project over three nights and he got a project award for 17 grand uh, to research, write and perform that three times. If you like research and write it and perform it three times at the project. Um, and I guess I kind of like it was an incredible show and it filled out the, the house every night. But I kind of it was kind of mind blowing to think that well, that's like what was that five and a half, six grand nearly per show like uh, when have we ever had that budget in literature yeah. what would happen if we did um, and so around that time I guess I read Ian's book as well and I knew that Ian I've maybe heard in the podcast that Ian had recordings of his grandfather as well so I was like I wonder could we get something where there's like the reading of his is like I suppose Minor Monuments for the stage version is a compressed version of a certain theme or thread in that book and um, so like what else could we bring to the stage if he was going to read that over the course of an hour and it turned out he had photographs we got a filmmaker involved who took film uh, of his kind of home place and we put together what it was what i was calling a live audio visual essay and um, but like he's the sound engineer uh, he's a good photographer. He just brought so much to the idea that it, it was it turned into his, like he, he was ultimately the creative director on that. And I turned into the producer. And um, with Sarah's show, that was kind of slight, again, it was from reading uh, Handiwork and just, I was interested in some of the themes and particularly one where she spoke about, you know, the requirement of obsession to make artwork to make great art and I think it's, she quotes it, Agnes Martin, another visual artist who kind of uh, was thinking along those lines and so uh, I, I guess I put in for the Arts Grant Award as a part of that award to commission her to write an essay but also to work with a filmmaker who would create a short documentary about her, that idea, her work uh, and her visual artwork as well. And then I went and found three other visual artists or two visual artists, one musician whose work also encapsulated that element of obsession. And so that is, you know, another audio visual essay where on stage is Sarah reading uh, an essay over the course of an hour. But that's that hour is interspersed with four short documentaries about other artists, their work. And in the end, the 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 completed essay was was completed after the documentaries were created so the essay really while connecting with handiwork really speaks to what's happening in the other artists work so it's really cohesive mm -hmm. hour-long show of kind of like uh, cinema and and creative non-fiction and so we are well we've kind of had two iterations of that one digitally at um Courch, one at Courch Arts Festival live 
uh, and we'll be at the Ennis Book Club Festival and in Listowel and in Linen Hall and Castle Bar and a few other venues kind of throughout the year. I suppose I was also interested in the idea of like, you know, if, right, we can pay the writers X to go up on stage that night and um, can we get them nine other gigs just like that around the country and mm -hmm. um, you know and make it really give give the kind of uh, hard work that we put into it and the rehearsal and all that you know give the show some longevity and um maybe bring it abroad and things like that mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and help them sell themselves sell their work so Front press books, sell Holy Show magazines, things like that, you know, so use use the event as a, as a way to sell books. So I think maybe that's what's exciting for organizations or publishers or journals who are interested in kind of taking things off the page and out and around. And um, is that it's an opportunity to meet people and you, you don't have to have a launch to sell books or get into bookshops or other yeah. avenues and and art centers, my God, with Ian's show, we, we just plan to create like three we would just do three iterations because you know that's all we had the budget for but it turns out venues are used to paying you know much bigger sums for events so if you can bring the production values and and uh, and the potential audience then yeah they they pay guarantees i suppose and they'll give you a, a flat fee to turn up and um yeah they're kind of in the region of like a grand upwards um, yeah. so that so you know if you're putting together your project award in, you can start to think about right who else can fund this what else can we add to the budget how can we beef it out and there are other like uh, festivals and venues that, that are interested in, in taking these ideas and I think mm -hmm. you know yourself Danny that venues are, are, are just another avenue uh, to pay writers and for publishers to get their work out there they're they're screaming for ideas we're just yeah. not connected to each other yet we're just beginning to be connected to each other so yeah well so, absolutely yeah. yeah absolutely i think it's another platform for us to promote uh what we love you know good writing and and writers and whatever in or connection there is to an audience you've mentioned themes there brendan a bit and kind of teasing out some of these themes which is i guess traditionally what curators do at our festivals and a lot of the time they will look to uh, publishers or the work itself to see kind of what might make sense. So I think that the Literature Project Award is a good uh, way as well for people to be able to have creative time with ideas and see kind of what they think from a research point of view. Um, Sarah, two of the writers that Brendan has mentioned there who he's worked with had an interest obviously in a desire to bring their work to life in a different iteration but it did originate from their Trump press publications and I know most recently Darren Negrifa has also been on a journey with a ghost in the throat what is that like for you as a publisher to kind of see that and see your writers embarking on this process and do you think it's an advantage to publishers? Oh absolutely I mean I must say um Brendan, your production of um, those elements of Mine and Monuments is just one of the most satisfying artistic experiences th that I've seen live ever, ever, ever. I mean, I think for anyone who is very familiar with that book and very familiar with um, the idea of the author's grandfather and what was missed and their, his relationship with his grandparents and the rest of his family, and then to, to actually hear that voice um, that he talks so much about in the, in the novel, in the in the work is just immensely satisfying and immensely moving and it was so um beautifully simply subtly powerfully done um and so just as a person who enjoys arts experiences you know it's that's wildly satisfying um but as a publisher of course it's beneficial um if i can speak about sales i guess um when we're when we're thinking about publishing a book and um we're thinking about who to kind of tar you know who's going to enjoy this the way we enjoy this and who who's going to um you know pick up a copy in a book in a bookshop for example we kind of think in terms of spheres so there's kind of a tramp sphere of people who'll just buy a tramp book and then there's going to be you know the sphere around the author themselves who've maybe been fans of previous work um and those little spheres or bubbles are quite easy to access um and that's how publishing works essentially and if we can get particular booksellers on board who are very um able at hand selling a book you know that's brilliant as well um, and then prizes create their own little bubbles but trying to reach readers who 
would not have come across any of these ways of being reached by us um, is, is very difficult. And, you know, this is just a great way to reach new audiences, I guess, is all I'm trying to say. Um, it's very satisfying us for us to be able to roll up and try and sell a few books. I think that's brilliant. Um, but I think at the end of the day, we're mostly interested in art um, and in seeing art or even a particular theme that's been worked on so much in a book just carried across in a new way is is lovely um and really worthwhile and that's that's an art in itself um as we were saying earlier in the conversation authors are usually cross-disciplinary just by nature um obviously Sarah Baum is a very um um productive interesting visual artist um and she's had exhibits you know in London and in Cork um Darren is obviously a poet mostly and um, before she came out with this sort of her first prose book um, and so it just makes sense that she'd want to do sort of a theatrical reading set to music and um, so yeah just being able to see writers who work with us be able to express themselves and express these themes in other medium is, is fantastic. And I guess that's it as Brendan had previously mentioned previous there were opportunities for writers maybe to work collaboratively but there were awards in dance or music or theatre whatever they might be and writers were sometimes being drafted into those awards and I think one of the things about the Literature Project Award is that it's specific to literature so it does finally mean that the whether the writer or a creative producer working with a writer or a publisher or a medley of, of those things, they can all come together with the creative juice and ideas to go towards something and do something that's led in that direction. And, and I guess outside of the festival circuit and outside of the publishing circuit, that is something we haven't really necessarily seen before, not, not in a funded sense anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm mindful, I suppose, like me, I was a, a recipient of the Literature Project Award last year, and we've been in 2021, which we initially obviously thought would be radically different to 2020, and uh, it has been what it has. Uh, and we're here now, I guess, in, in August of this year. I'm just kind of curious to know for you, from the time of your application and then award to now, what have what has it been like to produce this project? Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some hurdles or changes that you've you've made, and yeah. and uh, and maybe from the the actual process of application to now, kind of you know, are there significant kind of learnings or things that you would remark on from your own experience? Well, I mean, there have been hurdles in that the Royal Irish Academy was closed for a long time. So you can't be a podcaster in residence in a place that is actually doesn't have its doors open. So that was quite tricky. Um, now, they're brilliant to work with. So they've allowed me in on the days that they're allowing people in. So that was tricky to try and find the material. Uh, then when you say that you're going to you know, use the resources of a collection with thousands of works in it. It's quite overwhelming. So you go in and you're you're you you have everything at your disposal, and it's almost so difficult to narrow it down. Um, so and the academy is again closed in August, so it's not open again till September. So there's a very short amount of time to get in there. There's two hour reading periods, and then you're trying to within the episodes. So there's six episodes that focus specifically on a single writer per episode. You're trying to find um, references and shelf marks which might resonate with those writers so it's it's going through a lot of material to find things that might work for a writer to respond to or echo in some way with their work um, so there was a lot of stopping and starting and um, and and initially I had offered the writers as a fee and I changed that fee slightly I upped it because there's just so much communication to say sorry this isn't going ahead sorry it's you know sorry it's me again you know I haven't forgotten you you're there it's going to happen but it'll be a little bit further down the line and this keeps happening and it's nobody's fault it's just the way it is and where we are when it came to the application um I, I do I am familiar with filling out applications and I think that anybody who works in the arts you know you have your skill but you also everyone's a professional at filling out applications at this stage we're almost more practiced at that than we are in some of our own kind of disciplines so uh, it's a bit of a nightmare for people but because in broadcast you fill out applications almost on a monthly basis um, I was quite used to it so I found this application reasonable in that there's a very short space 
to crystallize your idea. And I actually think that it's really beneficial to actually to have to crystallize something and say, look, in 500 words, can I describe what I'm trying to do? And uh, after, you know, starting at 2000 words, you eventually get it down. And then because they've allowed you to categorize your material into different areas, whether it be your budget or whether it be uh, supporting material or maybe bi uh, biogs or CVs of the participants, then, you know, at least you know where you're putting things. So it's, it's achievable. I would give it a bit of time, but it's achievable. Um, and in terms of filling out applications, I don't want to get sort of all head girly about this, but I do feel that this is taxpayers' money. So you really have to justify what you're going to spend it on. Mm -hmm. um, and the more you justify in your application why you are spending money or why you're spending a day on a particular um, task and say that in, you know, in a paragraph, then the person who's reading that application is going to get a much better idea of your project. So you've given your synopsis, you've given a treatment of how you're going to approach your chosen subject, whether it's a live show, whether it's a journal, whether it's a piece of writing, or um, whether it's a podcast. But with, for example, in my budget notes, I would give a note, a little footnote for each of them. I'm a producer, I'm going to spend a half day uh, on this production and a half of that day is going to be over the space of six months and four hours are going to be spent writing emails to the Royal Irish Academy to say this is where I'm at. Half a day is going to be spent on writing my marketing material. Half a day and, and, and outline it. So then you can really easily see when you quantify how much time you're going to spend on something, how long the project's going to take and it'll help you as well. And then months later, when you come back to open up your application and say, yes, great, I've been successful. You actually have a little bit of a key as to what you said you were going to do and how you were going to do it. So it's it's worth sort of breaking down everything uh, in the application to amount of days spent, you know, who's getting money for what, if you're getting people involved in it, are they going to be there for more than four hours? Are they going to need lunch? Are they going to need travel to and from? Are they going to be presenting you with receipts? All of those things have to be considered because it's people's time, it's valuable, and it is yeah. taxpayers' money. Yeah. So really, really, it's justifying absolutely everything. Why are you spending three days? And in my case, there's some sort of a duplication of roles because I'm writing something, I'm presenting something, I'm producing something, I'm editing something. And I'm justifying in my budget notes, what are my duplication of roles? Why on one day do I have this hat on and another day do I have this hat on? And saying, look, I'm not trying to charge you for something that it, it, you know is the same thing on this day I'm doing this and this day so it's really important that, that that would be the main thing justify absolutely everything yeah and I think what you're saying there Zoe which is you know something Brendan would be very familiar with too all of that time emailing time you know all of content writing and stuff like a lot of the time in the arts and with literature particularly those costs haven't been recognized you know in different um areas and I do think like you say it's people's time and people should be paid for it I thought one of the great benefits of this award in terms of um the lighthouse project that I've been producing this year was being able to pay people fairly for travel days site visit days you know per diems all of these kinds of things that I guess we're aware of but in literature we haven't really had uh unless you're with particular festivals or events and even then the rules are quite different for different places so there are standard things in theater and in film that we don't seem to have yet in literature I feel like these types of awards will establish a lot of best practice too in terms of what people should be paid for and what it actually takes to generate a project how components um, come together um, I'm wondering with your idea Zoe was this a kind of uh, something that had been percolating for you you know for a couple of years or did you see the Lister Project Award and then sort of you know brainstormed to come up with something was it something that was already there that you were pleased then to see there might be an avenue to actualize it? Um, well I think with this um i think that there's a bit of a gap in in um nature writing in ireland i mean we've seen a lot over the last couple of years but there's a long time where we really weren't uh, there when it comes to what was happening in the uk and what was happening in the us so it, it was 
I was trying to find a way to bring nature writing into some of the work that I do. Um, so when this came up, I thought this was a great opportunity. And, you know, just this week when we see the climate change report, the UN climate change report and um, and how how, you know, we really I think one of the lines in my application was, look, we're on the brink of environmental catastrophe. What can writers do to look at nature or help people appreciate nature? or address it or keep it in people's minds. So that was really the impetus for it. And then the fact that it was a little bit more fluid, you could kind of invent what you wanted to do. You didn't have a gatekeeper saying you can't do this. Um, you just decide what you want to do and you can have a bit more playfulness with the form like Brendan was saying that, you know, we don't have to be siloed into this is literature and this is radio and this is, you know, this is a journal. All of these things can exist together and in fact, by all of them existing together and, and interplaying with each other, it just makes the scene a little bit more exciting. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it, it does, as uh, Sarah said, bring new readers in mm -hmm. and um, people who would never have thought of, you know, listening to a podcast who are interested in nature, people who are interested in podcasts, but hadn't thought about listening to a nature one now or writing. You know, so it's trying to bring different strands together, new listeners, new people who are interested and, and pique their interest in some way and in new ways. Absolutely. And it's really nice to see so many creative brains getting the opportunity to go in whatever direction they feel inspired to do, because I think, like you're saying, in terms of drawing in new audiences and diverse audiences, you're kind of thinking thematically about something that you're passionate about. And then it's this lovely symbiotic relationship between that theme or that thing and then a book or a writer or a certain type of writing. I know Brendan with Handiwork and Sarah Baum like the themes in that of just making and the the impulse to make and sort of ritual and all of those types of things if you've read the book and love the books as I guess we all do you know when we're reading them in published form and proof form and so on and seeing people at festivals it's very easy to feel inspired by them but if people have not yet reached these writers or these types of texts, I think giving a kind of a, a road to them is really, really helpful in terms of being able to say, well, this is what this is about. And this is, you know, the type of, of story that you're getting and demonstrating, I guess we know that people can be visual or can be more into listening to something. It's kind of giving another way to look at art in general and look at literature as being something that does have a role to play and has a relationship with other art forms, whether that's music or, or sound or visuals. Um, Brendan, from your practice of production in terms of literary productions in the past number of years, has it changed your practice and what would be key learnings that you might have from that area for others? Uh, I think, I just reiterate a lot of what Zoe said about the, the budget, like things take more time than you expect. And certainly when I come to like any application I've ever done, there's, a, there's always been that tension between what this actually costs if we pay everyone properly and what I think the Arts Council or whoever's funding can actually afford or what am I likely to get, something like that. Um, but I feel like the last, you know, the, the, the paying the artist policy in conjunction with the Arts Council's budget jumping significantly, uh, times have changed, I guess, and we can be a bit more confident in, in asking for, for fair pay and planning out your budget. And exactly as you said, Zoe, kind of thinking about all the, the different roles that you'll play in that project. Um, and if you know if you're an art organization or producer that you'll play you know certain roles for you certain budgets for the artist and um, so yeah i guess just being a bit bit more confident in in kind of asking for what's needed and and like if there if there are any writers listening as well like for example we, i had a visual artist i think other other artists from other art forms are maybe a bit ahead of us um, or there are more clearly delineated feeds for different kinds of work. Um, like we commissioned a writer to write kind of 700 words, 750 words towards a piece in the upcoming issue of Holy Show. Uh, and I offered like 250 quid. Uh, and she got back and said, like, actually, I, you know, charge 300. I think this is a day's work. 
my writing fee is 300 quid a day. I'm a slow writer. I'll give you this many words for this amount. And I'm like, yes, absolutely. You sound great because you're so bloody confident in yourself. This is wonderful. People, I don't think, you know, employers, if you like, will, will shy away from that kind of attitude. So we have to be a bit more bolshy, if that's the right word, confident. Bolshy is terrible. Confident uh, in ourselves and in our requests. And if you are going to the effort in an application of justifying, uh, you know, why you're getting paid as, as you will do, and um, then you should ask for kind of fair pay. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, Sarah, Brendan produced Minor Monuments and you were saying, you know, it's one of the best things that you've seen. And I suppose that Brendan is, is quite uh, modest about his own like contribution to that show. But um, I guess it, it's worth saying that um, some people can wear many hats in these processes and in other processes, uh, it might be useful to have a producer or another pair of eyes or ears on the work that you're making to um, give feedback because I think a lot of other project towards there would be a team of people or at least consultants I suppose we're lucky in the sense that a lot of us would have natural uh, peers who we would get to kind of evaluate or contribute to our work but when you saw them on your monuments and uh, it was obviously impressive to you, I suppose you attend many literary events and festivals and things, you know, what are you kind of looking for or hoping to see when you go to those types of settings? Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I picked minor monuments particularly to talk about just because unfortunately life being what it is, I didn't make it out to um, the other shows by our authors. Um, Mike McCormick's play, for example, sold out within moments. And so we didn't get to go, which is a huge bummer. I didn't manage to see Sarah Bombs either. So um, that was a real shame. Um, but um, what I loved about um, minor monuments and what I really enjoy seeing um, when I go out for some kind of arts event is, um, I guess a confidence in the production is really important so that you, you're made to feel like these people know exactly where they're taking you and they know why and you can kind of you're in safe hands, I guess, um, which I think is probably just the same as what you would call in literature, like a good strong voice. Um, so yeah, I would imagine that um, like I'm only a, 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 an, a, an audience member at these events, like I don't really have any great insights, a, apart from the fact that <laughs> my great insights, apart from the fact that you yeah you want to feel like you're looked after and perhaps you want and um, there, there's other stuff that you would have in common with um just a you know with reading a book too like you want to see something unique you want to be shown something you haven't been shown before or something that you've always secretly suspected um and it is surprising to see reflected elsewhere I guess um and I suppose when you're very familiar with a book and you go to see um you know, a theatrical production of some nature of this book, it's really nice to pick out elements of that work that perhaps a reviewer hasn't picked up on, or perhaps you never even really saw yourself and to have those unique themes taken out and explored further in this new medium, it, that's really nice to see. Mm. What about you, Zoe? Same question, I guess you go to a lot of uh, festivals, have been to a lot of different literary settings and, you know, what are you kind of hoping to see or what do you feel these types of avenues might yield in terms of offerings in the area of literature. I just think it's really exciting that people can just make it up. Let's make it up. I think that we don't have to, you know, go to broadcasters anymore. We don't have to go necessarily to publishers. We can just decide ourselves what we want to see. And I, the audience will tell you pretty quickly whether it's working or not. Um, so I'm just really excited to see loads of different sort of multimodal events. I really also like the idea, and it's something that I've tried to do a little bit as well, is that if you write something, you know, then it can be changed and adapted and made for radio and it can be changed and adapted and, uh, and, and access a different set of people if it's on a stage. So I think it's just using, you know, if you're writing a piece for a journal and it, you're getting 250 euros for it, it's not a huge amount of money. 300 euros isn't a huge amount of money, but what can you then do with that piece mm -hmm. that makes it something else? And then, you know, you're not reinventing what you're doing. You're just taking something, adapting it and reworking it. So I want to see people sort of making more use of their work, not trying to be new all the time, mm -hmm. trying to just find different ways to tap into what the precious things that they've already done and yeah. not try and chase new, new, new all the time because people are working hard enough as it is. It might take you three weeks to write a piece for a journal. 
but you Absolutely. can then change it, move it yeah. and, you know, and re-express it. And I think that generally people are looking for more experiential, more immersive ways of understanding literature. And it doesn't break it to play with it. It just makes it a different thing. So I think that I'm looking forward to seeing more things that are, are just sort of chewed up and spat out in a different way. Some of it will work, some of it won't, but sure, what's the harm in trying, really? Yeah, absolutely. So many lovely things you've said there, Zoe. I suppose, Sarah, you will know in terms of publishing, the window that books have and the kind of the life that they have after being published in terms of promotion and media promotion and kind of doing touring and stuff like that. So I think what Zoe is saying there too about books that we need to continue to celebrate and kind of honour and writers that, you know, continually need to be um, highlighted because there are new readers that, uh, out there all the time and you know we're talking about trying to connect with new readers and and show work um, to people who may not have accessed it already if anyone is watching the seminar and wants to get in touch about an application or prospective projects in the future that would pertain to this area i'd love to hear from you my details will be attached to the blurb of this seminar Thank you to the panelists, Brendan, Zoe, Sarah, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your experiences and your expertise. It's really lovely to chat. And I'm sure that there's actually a lot of material in here that is very relevant for uh, writers, literary producers and makers in this domain. So thanks so much for sharing today. Well, thank you, Diane. You're welcome.